dreadful chemical attack occurred in Syria, and we warn you, the footage is awful. Yesterday's attack was not the worst atrocity in six years of civil war there, but it should be a reminder that the country is a house of horrors. The question is, what should the U.S. do about that? Though in Washington, the usual forces appear to be gearing up for war in Syria. President Trump repeatedly pledged to keep the U.S. out of that conflict, but today indicated that that position could change. Well, I think the Obama administration had a great opportunity to solve this crisis a long time ago when he said the red line in the sand. And when he didn't cross that line after making the threat, I think that set us back a long ways, not only in Syria, but in many other parts of the world, because it was a blank threat. I think it was something that was not one of our better days as a country. Meanwhile, U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley also warned of a possible war there. Watch. Yesterday morning, we awoke to pictures, to children, foaming at the mouth, suffering convulsions, being carried in the arms of desperate parents. When the United Nations consistently fails in its duty to act collectively, there are times in the life of states that we are compelled to take our own action. Senator James Langford represents Oklahoma and serves on the Homeland Security and Intelligence Committee. He joins us tonight. Senator, thanks a lot for coming on. Glad to be with you. So the first thing that struck me about Ambassador Haley's remarks, apart from how horrifying this gas attack was, was her certainty about who did it. I'm certainly willing to believe the Assad government did it. Right. I've done it before. But this took place 24 hours before she made this statement. This is an incredibly complex company, country with uh, a, the number of actors we don't even know, the right. different factions fighting. That seems unknowable. How could anyone know for certain who did this 24 hours later? Fixed-wing aircraft flying over the area and explosions happened. Uh, there's only two folks to do fixed-wing aircraft uh, in that area, and that would be the Russians and be the Syrians, be Assad. Uh, so we can be pretty confident that it wasn't the rebel forces uh, flying any kind of aircraft over that area. They don't have aircraft to even be able to fly. Uh, so you can have a great deal of certainty on it. And this is not the first time that we've seen Assad use chemical weapons. He's used chemical weapons right, that's, consistently that's right. year after year after year. There's a lot of focus on it four years ago when he was using chemical weapons, but he's continued to use chlorine but, gas. But, and this is not a defense of the Assad regime right. or their tactics of war, right. merely an acknowledgement that I've heard many people say we know for certain. You know, they went to Niger to buy yellow cake. You know, we know this. And to base policy on something 24 hours later does seem premature. I'm not well, saying reckless, but close right. to it. Well, that, that is an area that we watch very closely in the intelligence community. Uh, we're able to track and be able to see flights coming in and out. We're able to watch. We're able to have satellite view on what's happening on the ground so we can track day to day what's occurring. Uh, so we have pretty good eyes on the sky of what's occurring. Okay. So we'll, I will grant that for the sake of argument. To progress to this idea common among everyone I know in Washington that in order to fight ISIS, we need to take out Assad. Now, Assad is, of course, fighting ISIS, right. maybe imprecisely, maybe ineffectively, but nonetheless doing so. How would that work? You take out the guy fighting ISIS, but it makes ISIS stronger? So I, uh, ISIS is really uh, birthed out of two conflicts that have fell apart. One of them, ISIS is fighting against Assad, and the other one is the vacuum that was created in Iraq. I, uh, Assad's been a ruthless thug, uh, killing his own people. Uh, the civil war that rose up there uh, in Syria was fighting against him. ISIS is simply joining into that. A lot of the recruiting worldwide uh, was to be able to join the caliphate fighting against Assad. Uh, so ISIS' main recruiting tool has been Assad. And if you go back to the earliest days of the civil war, everyone in the region was focused on one thing, the removal of Assad. Right, no, I Turkey, remember. Jordan, so the maybe. idea if you take out the guy that ISIS doesn't like, it'll make ISIS weaker. Pardon my skepticism, but it does raise the question, if you take him out, and we of course could tomorrow if we wanted, right. who would run Syria? Well, that, that has been the issue the Obama administration locked up on for years. Uh, they were waiting for someone organically uh, to grow up to suddenly be the big dog in the area that everyone would respect. That's not going to happen. Uh, the, you, the, there is no unified rebel force fighting against uh, Assad. It is a whole collection of basically neighborhood watch groups that this town, this town, this town all know that their life depends on Assad going down. They're not unified with each other. They're fighting for their families and also fighting against Assad. So the key thing that I hear from the leaders in the area is we have got to have the United States to engage to help select the next leader, international community come behind them, and to basically find a horse and to be able to bet on that horse. Boy. Because th this is about Iran's involvement. The big, the but the big last issue time here we is Iran. did this, I heard that exact argument was in Iraq, and the net effect was to vastly increase the power of Iran over Iraq, for right. one thing. So here are some of the, here's a quote, 
uh, verbatim, we should stay the hell out of Syria. The rebels are just as bad as the current regime. What do we get for our lives and billions? Zero. That's from Donald Trump in 2013. He went on to say, ask, how would you treat Syria if elected president? I let them all fight each other, focus on the United States. Make our country great again as they fight their war, he said. Stay out of Syria, he said. I could go on. Do not attack Syria. Bad things will happen. How did a guy who ran on not attacking Syria wind up today with no warning at all encouraging, hinting at, a war with Syria? Right, the engagement with Syria. The way that happens is you actually get the intelli intelligence information. You're tracking what's happening on the ground. Uh, you deal with the realities of four million refugees that are scattered all around the world, destabilizing the entire region. You see women and children uh, gasping for their life and realizing the entire world is waiting on the United States to make a decision but, I mean, in China, whatever way that we China engage. China murders its dissidents, executes people for their body parts. So should we invade China? I mean, once yeah. you make Allah Samantha Power, the moral excesses of other countries, a justification for going to war with them, where does it stop? It does have a direct effect on us, though, and that's the issue. ISIS does want to mean to do us harm. Al-Nusra means to do us harm. Al-Qaeda uh, fighting in the region means to do us harm. Uh, these are folks that have actually planned, coordinated, okay. uh, and prepared attacks to be able to come. And the big issue in Syria still is Iran. Iran is trying to form what they call their Shia crescent, right. running everything from Lebanon all the way to Yemen. They are a direct threat when they move into Syria and are right next to Israel. So if you want to be able to stabilize the democracies in the area like Israel and to stand with our allies uh -huh. there to keep Lebanon stable, uh, to keep Jordan stable, right. you've got to be able to stabilize what's happening in Syria. Senator, thank you for joining us. You bet.